Please silence your cell phones. Set your phasers to stun. <laughs> Welcome to the New York Public Library. Tonight we present the first conversation from the Coleman Center of our new season. Lincoln Prize winning historian Martha Hodes will discuss her new book, My Hijacking, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering with the renowned biographer and essayist Stacy Schiff. My name is Salvatore Scabona, Weinberg Director of the Dorothy and Louis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers here at the library. As some of you know, the Coleman Center selects 15 fellows a year for a nine-month term. Fellows receive an office in the center, access to our collections, and a stipend so they can focus exclusively on their work during their fellowships. The fellows are some of the best and most promising academics, independent scholars, poets, playwrights, journalists, dramatists, artists, and fiction writers at work today. They come here from around the country and the world to use the unparalleled collections housed at this library to write the books of tomorrow. You'll see around you some of the books that they've written and in blown up some of the uh, most recent ones of them. The Coleman Center was founded in 1999 a few weeks ago, we welcomed our 25th class of fellows to the Coleman Center. Congratulations and welcome to them. Many of them are here with us. I encourage you all to come back uh, on Tuesday, October 17th at 6 p.m. when we'll present a conversation about two Coleman Center Fellows books at once. Novelists Ayana Mathis and Justin Torres will speak together about their just released novels. Martha and Stacy will talk together for about 35 to 40 minutes and then they'll move on to your questions. If you'd like to pose a question, please write it on the index card that we've put on your seat. Staff members will walk along the outside aisles to collect your questions before the end of the one-on-one -on -one portion of our presentation. This event is being live streamed on YouTube and recorded by C-SPAN. If you're joining us virtually, please share your questions if you have them either in the chat or by emailing culmancenter at nypl.org, C-U-L-L-M-A-N, center at nypl.org. You'll find copies of my hijacking for sale in the hall. Martha has graciously agreed to sign your copy. Now to business. Stacy Schiff is the author of Vera, Mrs. Vladimir Nabokov which won the 2000 Pulitzer Prize for Biography, and saint Exupery, a biography, which was a finalist for the 1995 Pulitzer Prize. Her most recent books include Cleopatra, A Life, and The Witches, Salem, 1692. She's received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as a fellowship from the Common Center in 2002 to 2003. Martha Hodes is professor of history at New York University and the author also of Morning Lincoln, The Sea Captain's Wife, A True Story of Love, Race, and War in the 19th Century, and White Women, Black Men, Illicit Sex in the 19th Century South. She's the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEH, Harvard University, and the Whiting Foundation. She was a fellow here at the Coleman Center in 2018 to 2019. We owe her, I owe her a special debt of gratitude for serving really wonderfully for two years as the interim director of the Coleman Center until last month. Please help me welcome back to the Coleman Center, Martha Hodes and Stacey Schell. Thank you, Salvatore. Um, Martha, I'm so delighted to join you here. No one, what no one tells you about the Coleman Center is that when you leave, you have the feeling that you have been expelled from paradise. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be back. It's very bittersweet, but I'm thrilled to be back with you. Um, this book is, is about what happened to you in 1970, um, but it's also about how you retrieved those, that 50-year-old history. So I just thought we should start with an overview of what actually happened um, before we get into the reconstructing of what actually happened. Do you want to just describe the hijacking with a little bit of context? I do, and I will. I also just want to say very quickly thank you to Salvatore and the Coleman Center and to Stacy and all of you for being here this evening and all of you who are joining us virtually. I don't know if the microphone can pick up my fluttering heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a wonderful first question, Stacy. So I will say 
September 6, 1970, I was 12 years old. My sister, named Catherine, was 13. We were flying from Tel Aviv to New York. It was the end of the summer. We had spent the summer in Israel with our mother. My parents were modern dancers, Martha Graham dancers, and my mother had gone to Israel to help start Israel's modern dance company, the Betsheva Company. And we were coming back to return to school. And on that day, four planes were hijacked by members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And I can say more about them later. Um, one of those planes was foiled in midair. One was flown to Cairo, and everybody was evacuated, and the plane was blown up. Two of the planes, including the one my sister and I were on, flying unaccompanied, were flown to the Jordan Desert. And uh, three days later, another plane joined us. So there were three planes held hostage in the Jordan Desert. My sister and I were among those who were held in the desert inside the plane for six days and six nights. So let's leave it there okay. and back to you. Okay, okay. Um, so let's talk about the title for one second before we go any further, because a hijacking, you've just reclaimed the word hijacking as, as I see it, right? A hijacking is someone takes you away or takes something that you have away from you. And you've just basically said, no, 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 I'm gonna appropriate that hijacking for my own. So did you always think of yeah. the book um, as sort of my, was that the title as you worked? And, and just since I'm on that, you told a reporter in 1970, when you were 12 years old, that you intended to write a composition about your experiences in the <laughs> desert. <laughs> exactly. So I guess I could say, well, what took you so damn long? But, but so here, 50 years later, you finally have. So tell us what sent you down the road. And also, yeah. do please answer my title question, just because I'm very curious about that. Yes, and your own response is, is such a wonderful one. So. Um, I think I had this title for a long time, but when people would ask me the title of the book, I would always say that I didn't know what it was because I felt reluctant to name it. I think it is if about- If you name it, you have to write it. That's part well, of Well, that's problem, part of it, right? for sure. Yeah. And that was definitely an ambivalent process. Um, so partly it was about reclaiming something that had happened to me. It was also very clearly about being my experience. And I say that because each hostage had such different experiences depending upon everything from where you were sitting in the plane, what you slept through, what you were awake for, to your knowledge of Middle East politics in 1970 and where you stood on Israel-Palestine issues. There were so many variables. So I could only write my story, and that was definitely part of that pronoun, that possessive pronoun in the title. But I love what you said about the school composition, because you're absolutely right, Stacey. Um, I did not remember this, but when I was doing my research, there was an article, I think it was in Time Magazine or maybe Newsweek, where a reporter talked to me and then wrote this line that said, Martha Hodes, 12-year-old schoolgirl, I think I was called, said she was going to write a composition about this when she got home, which I never did, by the way. And we can talk about why I yes. didn't want to talk about the hijacking when I got home. And you are the second person to suggest, this had not occurred to me, that the title of the book is kind of like a, a seventh grade composition that you, that you might, well, I did. kind of like my summer vacation. <laughs> Wasn't exactly what I said, but, but yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll also just say that the, the subtitle, A Personal History of Forgetting and Remembering, is also about being personally uh, caught up in or participating in a, a world historical event involuntarily. And so it's, it's history, but it's also a personal history. Did the subtitle go through multiple permutations, or was that also fairly set from the start? I didn't have a subtitle for a long time. And then when I, I think I came up with it pretty quickly and then it stuck. And I always liked the subtitle, even if I was more ambivalent about the title. But I've come to like the title and I've come to think of it as my seventh grade composition. <laughs> um, in most seventh grade compositions, one does not make a narrative decision to play the whole saga the first time as, as memory and then the second time as history, which you did here. So right. was that obvious from the start that you were going to first sort of play with those shards of memory and then sort of back up and give us a full account, and a more objective account of what actually happened. I mean, it's a very difficult book to structure in a way because we have you, we have your perceptions of what happens. We have what's happening this propulsive energy of what's happening in the desert. And then we know there are two parents who are presumably 
you know, wh whom we need to also be able to see somewhere in that picture. So how did you how did you come up with the structure? Yeah, it was definitely not there from the beginning, as the historians or maybe any writers in the audience will know. Um, Historians like chronology, and we usually write things chronologically. And I did that. That was my first draft. It was just a big chronological draft. And I see my editor in the front row, the wonderful, amazing Jonathan Jao from HarperCollins at the time, now Simon & Schuster, who, who was the one who really helped me with this structure and said, why don't you start out by telling readers everything that happened? So what I did was I actually started in the preface, something of a preface. I, I give all the memories I had before I started writing the book. And that was genuine. I did write down those memories before I began researching and writing. So that's the first few pages. Then I tell the whole story. And then I go back and reconstruct what happened in several other parts, so including my parents' experience and some family context, and then reconstructing what happened in the desert, and then finally what happened when I got home. And that was, of all the books I've written, it was the hardest book to structure. And the one, I've never written a full draft of a book and then restructured it. And doing that was difficult, but I'm really glad that I did. So the initial structure was different from what we what it we're absolutely reading was, okay. yes, it was. Um, when you talk about what historians do, um, generally when we write history, we tend to look at documents. And we tend to um, believe that the documents are actually going to deliver up the story. And one of the richest sources you had here was your red-covered childhood diary, um, mm -hmm. though you turn out to have been, some, have been something of an unreliable diary keeper. Um, I say that with <laughs> great fondness. Um, so you say that you realize that you were, you now realize you were crafting the story in the diary as you went. You were writing the story as you could bear it, which was different from right. the truthful story, right. really. So it's like we tell ourselves stories in order to live, mm -hmm. but we tell ourselves the stories that we can live with at the right. same time, right? So at one point, you give us a list even of the things that you didn't write about in your diary. Um, so do you want to talk about that disconnect? Sure. And, and yeah. I mean, it's as much, the diary is almost like a record of what you erased as much as it is a record mm -hmm. of what you what you really preserve from those years. Yeah, that's so nicely said. And thank you so much for that question. So again, historians in the audience will know that we as historians love sources that date from the time and place we're writing about because they're considered the most reliable, closest to the event. And so I was an inveterate diary keeper uh, from about maybe 11, 10 or 11 years old. I kept a diary the summer I was 12. I had it with me on the plane. I hadn't read it since the hijacking, but I'd saved all my diaries in a carton in a closet somewhere. And I dug it out and I thought, this will be my scaffolding for this book. This will be the structure of the book here's what I experienced. And of course, that's not at all, not at all what I found, as you so eloquently put it, Stacy, in your question. What I found was that, and it took me a while to formulate this, but I realized that I crafted a story in my diary that I could tolerate, that I could live with. And although my parents would never read my diaries, it was a story I felt they could live with and they could tolerate. So some of the things I left out were, interestingly enough, some of the memories that I was never able to erase from my consciousness, even though I made an effort and I was quite determined not to absorb these things going on around me. And, and these were some of the, the most very frightening moments. The first was um, up in the air when the hijacking was taking place, the co-pilot emerging from the cockpit with a gun at his neck, um, an image I was never able to erase. Another was the night we landed, our captors wiring the plane with dynamite. Um, and another was, um, you know, some of, some of my captors were, were very nice and were very nice to the children especially. And some were, you know, they were different kinds of human beings. Some were not nice people. And there was one, one woman, um, there were several women commandos because the Popular Front believed deeply in women's liberation. That was part of their ideology. So the women were in charge of our plane. But there was one woman who was not a nice person at all. And she, at one point, pointed her gun to me as I was walking back to my seat. I didn't write down any of that. And it was so funny, because when I read my diary, I, I felt so frustrated with myself that I, that I didn't tell a full story. And then over the course of writing the book, I, I learned to have more empathy for that 12-year-old girl who wasn't able to absorb everything going on around her. But I just want to give our listeners one example that is so telling and was so important to me. Um, we landed on a Sunday night, and I first wrote my diary on Monday morning. 
And I described in my diary the hijacking. And I wrote this sentence. So my sister was sitting next to me, and she was crying up in the air because it was very scary. And so um, I used the word hostesses, which is what we called flight attendants in those days. <laughs> I said, the hostesses comforted a crying Catherine and calmed everyone. OK, then, and I must have done this when I got back, because it was the only time I re read my diary, I crossed out the words, a crying Catherine. So the sentence read, the hostesses comforted and calmed everyone. And, and I crossed it out really well. And it took a lot of light, <laughs> holding up to the light, to see those words. And so clearly, you know, my, my, old, my older sister, my protector, that she was afraid and she was crying, I, I couldn't bear that. So that had to be struck from the record. And that was such a clue to me that the record I kept was so incomplete and unreliable. You know, I think about all those times we spend in archives trying to read through yes. what someone has crossed out or erased. I just love that you fell into your own trap. Right? Absolutely <laughs> did. Um, <laughs> let, since you just led me right into it, can we talk a little bit about your sister? And sure. um, you have such different takes. I mean, it's so fascinating. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you tell the story, and I won't tell it for you. But you're a year apart, a year and a half apart. Mm -hmm. And you have completely different takes on what happens. And it's almost as if you outsource your emotions to her mm -hmm. on some right. level. Right. Um, and you also reveal that there's a 17-year-old boy who himself has a completely different take on what's right. happening. Mm -hmm. um, so did you and your sister? I know you didn't really talk about this over the years. Was there a code for we're not going to talk about it? Did it just mm. never come up? Were you never in an airport together where one of you turned to the other and sort of mm. looked away and said, no, we're not going to discuss that? I mean, what was, how did that even work? So my sister, Catherine, was, you're, you're right, just a year and a half older than I. Um, she was the older sibling. And I think like any older sibling, she felt responsible for both of us. Like any younger sibling, perhaps, I did, I like what, the way you put it, Stacy. I, I let her be my buffer. She was the one who answered the commando's questions when they questioned the hostages. She was the one who um, made sure she was very concerned that we would not be separated. And she made sure that that was not going to happen or told herself that she wouldn't let that happen. When we were released, she was the one who answered reporters' questions. She was the one who got us a hotel room in the capital city of Amman that night. So she did everything. And for that reason, she had to be much more present and much more conscious. And I think that's one of the reasons I was able to not absorb everything going on around me. In the book, I, I think of her in a way as my hero. But you know, she and I have talked about it. Of course, she read the book before it went to press and was, was incredible and, and talked to me all through the process of writing it. But um, you know, she pointed out that just to call her a hero doesn't, doesn't do justice to her own experience, because she was a child, too. And it was traumatic for her as well. And she was, she was also a survivor of, of all of this. Um, and so as far as. I should also say this, that after my sister read the book, after it was published, she said the most wonderful, she made the most wonderful formulation. She put it this way. So these are her words. She's speaking. She said to me, you forgot and wanted to remember. I remembered and wanted to forget. That's not in the book because it came after, but it was so absolutely right. And then, you know, you asked about I not love that you say that's not in the book. It is in the book. Those words are not oh, in the book. Okay. Those, the quotation <laughs> isn't, but you're absolutely but I right. I think that's fascinating. The spirit of that is absolutely so in the book. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I wouldn't say there was any sort of code. Um, I would say that in 1970, children as a rule were not encouraged to talk about terrible things that had happened to them once those things were over. That wasn't true of all the children who were on the plane. There were some families who did make, make a point of talking about the hijacking, but it was true of the majority of of former hostages and fellow hostages I spoke with, um, that the idea was just to go back to school. And you know, my father had gone to my school and my sisters and said, you know, Martha won't be here at the opening of school. She's on one of those hijacked planes. And you know, my teachers did not even know. They didn't even tell the teachers. I mean, in this day and age, there would be counseling. And, there would, you know, for, for, and my best friend, who every time a teacher called my name at the beginning of school at Love attendance, this. had to say, she's not. Martha's not here because she's on one of those planes, but, but could we save her a seat you know, in the front row because she's, she's short? you know? And it was actually very traumatic for her, for my best friend. But, but nobody, and I also got in touch with teachers when I was writing the book, some of my seventh grade teachers, and they were astounded. They had never been told 
that this had happened. And I think the first time, just to answer the last part of your question, um, my sister and I never talked about it. When 9-11 happened, and I, I want to be very clear that 9-11 was very different. Um, our hijackers were Marxist-Leninists. They were not Muslim jihadists. The Popular Front had an internal policy of causing no harm to any hostage, and they, they did not. And that's very different, obviously, from 9-11. Nonetheless, multiple hijackings on one day brought up a lot of remembrances. And that's when my sister and I said to each other, I'm thinking about it again. And it was, it was really hard. And then after that, it took me 15 more years to think about writing the book. No reason for that, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I want to talk to you. I want to ask you further about your sister. But the one thing I, that really struck me, by the way, you're traveling on the same passport. I didn't even know that yes. was a thing. Yeah. And the fact that you're joined on that passport is exceptionally right. poignant, I think, as right. you read. I mean, the two little faces on yeah. one travel document. Yeah. Anyway, um, just because you touched on them, I realize we should really talk about the hijackers before Please. we go much further. So yes. they're Marxist, um, they're Marxist Leninists from the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Um, do you want to explain why they want to land the planes in Jordan? Because I think that yeah. was unclear even mm -hmm. at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, their ideology was unclear to most of you on the plane, certainly to you as children it would have been. And can, can you tell us about um, their demands and mm -hmm. how they impressed or failed to impress those demands yeah. upon you, the hostages? Yeah, thank you so much, Stacey. This was a really important part of my research and one of the wonderful resources here at the New York Public Library um, Interestingly enough, the Dorot Jewish Division holds collections of an enormous number of documents published by the Institute for Palestine Studies, which is really a phenomenal set uh, of volumes because it includes every position paper, every speech, every letter that might have appeared in an Arabic newspaper in translation. So it really, along with autobiographies from my captors and, and interviews they gave on film and books they wrote, it really helped me understand a context that I didn't understand at the time. And I will say, speaking of my sister, who was not that much older than I, but she seemed to have, she was so politically smart and she, she grasped so much about, about our Palestinian captors and their plight. And she, I feel like she understood it so much better than I did. Uh, so the Popular Front was founded in 1967, right after the 67 war. And that was just three years after the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, had been founded. The Popular Front were, were a younger generation, considered themselves revolutionaries. They were a minority, but influential. Their leadership was, was drawn from the well-to-do doctors, lawyers, intellectuals. Um, they spoke multiple languages, along with Arabic, English, French, German. They recruited membership from the refugee camps and from much poorer classes, but the leadership was um, an extraordinary class of people. Um, their goal was a single, democratic, pluralistic, secular state of equal rights for Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and, uh, and atheists, as they were. Um, they, one of their strategies was hijacking, and they were among the minority of the PLO. Most of the PLO and the PLO's leadership, including Yasser Arafat at the time, did not approve of hijacking, of the taking of innocent civilians. And eventually, the, the Popular Front did renounce that strategy. But they were not at all representative of the PLO in that way. Jordan, you know, that, that took me a long time to figure out. Jordan was such a, a funny nation in 1970. Um, allies of both the United States and Israel, but of course, um, Jordan and Israel were enemies of each other. Um, the Popular Front made its headquarters in the capital city of Amman, and they picked Jordan because it was an easy place from which to make their own strikes into Israel on their own, own military strikes. Um, but the Jordanian and Palestinian population was, it, it was a, a a complicated mix. Um, it wasn't Jordanians versus Palestinians, but m I would say most of the population, both Jordanians and Palestinians, did not like or approve of the Popular Front being in control of the city of Amman. They, they kind of made it a state within a state. But of course, many of the Palestinians who lived in Jordan um, had been displaced from their homes in 1948 and then again in 1967 because they had settled on the West Bank. So a very complicated set of populations, of hostilities, of allyships. Um, and the Jordan Desert, of course, was a place 
where we could land and the commandos could be in control of the, of the planes. The, the tanks of the Jordanian army were surrounding us and we could see them. Um, so the Jordanian army was in a war with the popular front. So the city of Amman was a war zone, but we could see the tanks on the horizon. And of course, somebody explained that to me. I had absolutely no idea about any of this. And I remember one of the, um, one of the young, young women who, who befriended us saying, look, you see those tanks out there? That's the Jordanian army. They're on our side. And I just, it was so hard for me to understand that. So the theories and the ideologies are really going over your head, obviously. They, but, but one line that reverberates throughout the book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make a mess of it right now, the friendly yes. country with friendly people. Yes. Can you just tell it? Yes. It's just, it's such a... Yes. Straight to the heart. So thank you also for bringing that up. Um, when we were up in the air during the hijacking, one of the commandos took over the PA system and said, um, you are landing in a friendly country with friendly people. And I do remember thinking, oh, good. You know, <laughs> then <laughs> they'll, they'll know that I need to get home to my dad. They'll well, understand your teachers that. were waiting for you, and they were Everybody was, was, was waiting yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. and. You know, the thing about writing from memory is that you have to corroborate your memory. Every single person I talked to and every newspaper article I read, or nearly every, somebody quoted that line. So all of the hostages remembered that line. So I knew that it had been said. And I will say that, I hinted at this before, but some of the hostages had very frightening experiences in their um, interactions with our captors. Some of them were interrogated, and the interrogations were to determine people's connection to the state of Israel in order to determine who would be a valuable hostage. At the same time, the commandos were quite kind to the children. And um, my experiences of them were, were quite positive. So for example, there was one day when my sister, again, we were in the desert sitting next to me, and, and she was crying. And one of the men stopped by our row, and he looked at her, and he said, don't cry. We have children, too. And that felt very fatherly to her. And of course, we missed our father terribly. And when we were let outside the plane for air and exercise, um, some of the commandos jumped rope with us, um, gave the kids piggyback rides. The little kids, we were too old for that. And I also have a memory of, you know, we were in the middle of a desert. And so along with the tanks on the horizon, there was a mirage of water. And it looked like we were surrounded by water. And one of the commandos who understood the science of mirages, you know, knelt down on the sand with the kids and, and told them, you know, why, why you're seeing water and that it's not real. So not only were they kind to us, but um, my sister and I were interested in the stories that they told. It was very important to them that the hostages understand their history and their stories. And, you know, I have to say my sister and I were very different from many American Jews who went to Israel in 1970, which was three years after the 67 war. Um, we were there because my mother was a dancer. We didn't have, we hadn't gone to Hebrew school. We didn't have Zionist ties. We didn't have a sense of the narratives that other people brought with them. And we were interested in the stories and we felt sorry for the commandos, many of whom had lost their homes in 1948. There were also Holocaust survivors on the plane, and we felt terribly sorry for them as well. So as kids, we it was like we felt sorry for everyone, and we wanted to solve everyone's problems, but we couldn't think of a way for everything to work out for Israel-Palestine. We just, we couldn't think of, couldn't think of a solution. <laughs> and, um, this is a great surprise that the two Surprisingly. Right. But we wanted to, and, and we felt sad for everybody. And of course, not all the hostages were sympathetic or empathetic to our captors, but some who had grown up in Zionist households were interested in, in what they were learning and what they heard, even if ultimately they kept their own views. Um, so as we sit here tonight, um, a statue of Saint Exupéry's Little Prince is being installed on Fifth Avenue across from the French Consular Services, and I bring this up just randomly because <laughs> um, bring this up because threaded through your entire book in the most intriguing and, and beguiling manner are lines from The Little Prince, which is a book you were given by your stepfather. Is that right? That's right. That summer, which you had pretty much seemed to have committed to memory. Um, so I have two questions. How did that happen? And does the, is the little prince now for you 
a book also about been, having been hostage in the desert for six mm -hmm. days. I mean, are the two things completely braided together at this point in your mind? Thank you so much for asking that, Stacey. And I have to say, Salvatore mentioned this, but I don't know if people pick this up. Um, it, it's really special to be talking to you because you were the biographer of the author of Little Prince and Exuberi, so which, and that biography was also important to me as I, as I was puzzling out the meaning of that book, so thank you. So yes, you're absolutely right. In my diary, I found the words um, telling me that I had read The Little Prince that summer, the summer before the hijacking, that my Israeli stepfather had given us the book, read it to us, and that I had read it many times over. And then, when I met with one of my fellow hostages, she was a a 19-year-old woman from Brooklyn who was very, very kind to my sister and me. And I met with her while I was writing the book, and she gave me the account she had written um, while we were, while we were, actually I should say when she got home, she wrote out her account and she gave it to me. And you know, I, I said to her, I said, I, I can scan this on my phone. And she just handed me her sheaf of papers and said, no, apparently I saved this for you for 48 years and gave me her original copy in her account. And I didn't remember this. She writes about my sister, she and my sister and I sitting by the open door of the airplane one evening, gazing out at the desert and the stars and talking about the book, The Little Prince. So. Given all of that, of course, I reread the book, which I hadn't read in decades. And if there's anybody who doesn't know, it's, it's a story about an aviator who crashes in the Sahara Desert. And then um, the book is about his encounters with this strange character he calls the Little Prince. And as I was reading, I felt there was so much that was connected to the things I was writing about. And so you're right, Stacy. in almost every chapter, I quote something from The Little Prince, and, and i just like to give a couple of short examples of, of some of my favorites. One is um, when I write about my sister and I learning about the plight of Palestinians, I quote a line where the aviator in The Little Prince says, and once again, without understanding why, I felt a queer sense of sorrow. And that so much describes how I felt at 12. And then another line that I loved so much, um, when my sister and I arrived at Kennedy Airport, my father and stepmother were there, and I talked to my stepmother about it. And what she remembered was that we were uh, quite cheerful. And she put it this way, so these are my stepmother's words. She said, no tears, no crying, ready to go. And then there's a wonderful line in The Little Prince that I, that I invoke at that point, where the aviator says about The Little Prince, nothing about him gave any suggestion of a child lost in the middle of the desert. So it was just so perfect, and there are, there are examples like that for every chapter. The book The Little Prince is an enigmatic story. I think the way I think about it now is that it gave me words to describe feelings that I wasn't able to describe, not only at the time, but also partly when I was writing the book. So that's what the book is to me now. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, okay, so finally you decide, after a few years, to delve into this miasma of your past. Um, can you talk about, I mean, it's, I can't even begin to imagine the emotional preparation that was required, how you prepared yourself for going to the motion picture research room of the National Archives and, I, and to watch the footage. And I thought we would, I would set you up to read a little okay. bit um, yeah. from page 214, which and maybe you could just set up that visit back to sort of watch that person on the screen. Sure. So thank you. Um, it was hard. Doing the research was quite difficult. And I often did have to prepare myself. And at one point, I'll just, I'll just tell this anecdote. I, was, I did a lot of research in the State Department um, in the National Archives. There were just troves and troves of telegrams. Um, and I read through all of the telegrams, and I came to the end of this September 1970 folder. And the next folder started in October, and all the f hostages were home by October. So I didn't think I'd find anything in there. But when I opened it, I found something that I remembered quite well, which was, um, a sheaf of papers, literature, that our captors had given out for the hostages to read, spelling out their plight. I'd always remembered the opening words, which went something like, ladies and gentlemen, I feel it is my duty to explain why, have, why we have done what we have done. And I saw those words, and I scanned the entire document, and it took me two years to go back and read it. It was just it was just too much because I remembered sitting on the plane reading it. So what you're talking about, Stacy, is, is a moment, and I will be happy to read this passage. Um, 
when I was in what's called the Motion Picture Research Room of the National Archives, and I had a wonderful, wonderful researcher there help me find these CIA tapes. And um, it, was, it was kind of raw footage that the press had filmed completely out of order and then turned over to the CIA. So here, here's what I say about it. On a summer day nearly 50 years later, I watch unedited news footage in the motion picture research room of the National Archives. The scenes appear in haphazard order. Though the three planes had sat only about 30 miles from Amman, the trip out of the desert took a couple of hours, and it was early afternoon in the capital when we arrived. Watching the tapes, I see some of what I remember. The building stands against the hilly terrain beyond the city's downtown, palm trees reaching to the top of the ground floor. The letter J in the sign for Hotel Jordan Intercontinental sports a 1960s style curly cue. Soldiers direct our vehicle, a commando holds a megaphone, horns honk, cameramen run beside our van. 13 minutes in, the tape switches to the inside of a van, passengers displaying expressionless caution. A photographer has thrust his camera straight into one of the open windows. And there we are. I sit impassively, hand to cheek. Shielding me, partly obscuring me, Catherine looks straight into the lens, serious, responsible, afraid. She twists around to look out the windows, scanning the commotion, planning what to do, thinking, how can I keep us from being separated? How can I keep Martha safe? Tentatively, then, I look around, too. Large cameras and microphones completely surround us, shooting pictures rapid fire. Another reporter's hands holding a camera come in through the window, snapping one photo after another. Right there on the screen before my eyes is the 12-year-old girl I've been trying to conjure. But there's that feeling again. Despite all the documents, despite all the people I've talked to, many of whom, after all, don't remember Catherine and me. There's the feeling the hijacking must have happened to someone else. Studying the moving image of that girl makes me feel more than anything else like a historian coming upon a visual representation of her long-researched subject for the first time. Watching the tape all these years later, I write down, I can't believe I was there. It's an extraordinary passage, Martha. It really, it really is. So I'm, I'm going to unfortunately throw a question at you you're not going to want to hear, which is after that immensely emotional passage, do you think any of this has anything to do with what you went on to do for a living? You're not at all the first person to Thank ask you. me that, Stacey. But you know, I never thought about it until the first person asked me that. And I think the first person was my agent, Wendy Strothman, who couldn't be here this evening. You know, I was. I know I was, it's an impertinent question. No, I it's a, it's actually a great question. I, I, English was my favorite subject in high school, and I just figured I'd be an English major in college. And then it's kind of a roundabout journey. I took an introductory religion class. I loved it, and that might have had to do something with something to do with being brought up in a, such a secular household and, and being interested in world religions. So I became a religion major, and then I got a master's degree at Harvard Divinity School studying comparative religion. And while I was a student, a grad student, I had a, I had a work study job at the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women. And I found that I loved being deeply involved in people's personal papers and daily lives. And I liked that more than the abstractions of religion and philosophy. So that was my journey from English major to religion major to historian. And then I went on to get my PhD in history. But I had never put the hijacking into that narrative. And I don't know how it fits, but, but I'm not at all dismissing the fact that it might fit in there. Just an impertinent question. Um, and now another million dollar question. Um, we always head first and foremost to the diaries as historians, because of course that's the beating heart of the matter, right? And that's presumably the, the unvarnished truth in some way. Um, so does this make you read history or write it any differently? And in your research, you come up against some enduring untruths about the whole yeah. ordeal, in fact. Um, it wasn't true that the Popular Front detained only the Jewish hostages, Correct. for example. And as late as 2020, I think the Jerusalem Post was getting the story right. wrong. Right. So where does all of that misinformation leave you as an historian? And, yeah. and how do you write history if you can't trust memory? That's just a tiny question. Oh, just a tiny question. Um, so first of all, historians and then I'll all get to know. The audience questions. Yeah. Historians all know uh, that memory is unreliable. So you know, for reading court testimony and and people are sworn to tell the truth, we still know it's based on memory. So 
That didn't surprise me, but because my own documents were my sources, it was in a way utterly shocking that memory could be so unreliable. And I, I knew that certainly from writing my book about Lincoln because one of the things I did in that book was the reminiscences of Lincoln's assassination were so wildly off that I decided when I wrote the book that I would only use the sources that happened within weeks and months of the assassinations, the letters and diaries that people wrote. So that just made it so real to me um, how unreliable sources can be. And then your point about enduring myths was, was, was also a very important one to me. Um, one of the enduring myths was, was, as you mentioned, that our captors immediately sent all the non-Jews away and detained only Jews on the plane. That's not what happened. But, but to be fair, I think that myth endured because what did happen was very confusing. And it was very confusing to the hostages. So I have some empathy for that misunderstanding. Um, there was one evening where the captors read out certain names and certain people from our plane were permitted to leave for the city of Amman. And everybody who left was not Jewish. And that was very clear. At the same time, there were many Jews who were still detained on our plane. And that same night, Jews from the other plane, which was a Swiss airplane, were permitted to go to Amman. There was also a group of about 50 hostages who were held two weeks longer, and about two thirds of them were non-Jews. So it was, it was complicated because that, that night, when only Jews left our plane, the people who left were not Jewish, I should say. The people who left were not Jewish, but the people on the plane were Jews and non-Jews. Um, that, was, that was confusing and, and frightening to people. And so that, I think that myth grew from that, from that moment and from those memories, which were hard to erase. Um, but when I was reading other sources, interviews, et cetera, I constantly came upon hostages giving interviews saying, you know, after that evening when that happened, our captors never distinguished between Jews and non-Jews again. Um, and again, you know, our captors were human beings and some of them, some of them made strategic mistakes, you know, and afterwards this was something that came out quite a lot, you know, by asking the hostages, are you Jewish, which was a way to determine connection to the state of Israel, your value as a hostage. That was, that was a very poor choice of question because it was, it was very frightening to many of the Jews who were on the plane, especially if you were a Holocaust survivor. So very confusing, complicated, nuanced kind of situation, but it was very important to me in the book, and I do this to make clear that that wasn't the object of our captors. Oh, so along the same lines, um, an audience member would like to know, have you thought about your next book project? And <laughs> no pressure, and um, thinking about going back to Lincoln or writing more memoir. Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Um, I always take a long time between projects, so I'm not, um, not feeling pressure about that. It's been such an interesting experience writing about my own memories and writing about 20th century history. So part of me just longs to go back to the 19th century where none of my historical actors are alive. <laughs> and I can read their documents and do what I will with them. And a world where I feel, you know, the historian has a certain amount of control over that. So it's very possible I will go back to the 19th century. On the other hand, you know, writing this and, and, and talking to friends from my past who knew me then has been very important. A tiny little part of me thought about writing fiction. And my agent said, oh, Martha, don't do that. <laughs> I think she, it's, But she's not here tonight, is she? Uh, <laughs> she's listening. Um, you know, I think there's a way in which everybody wants to write a novel. Um, I don't think I'll do that. But I don't know yet. I, I'm not sure if I, if I have enough time in my life, I, I might stay in the 19th century and also and also write something more about my own experiences. But do you think in a way it has reshaped how you read documents on some level? I think it has. And I, I mean, I, there's nothing I didn't know about reading documents, but what I said before, how stark it became and how clear it was, especially about what I left out of my diary, because we can read, especially in the 19th century, you know, people wrote voluminous letters with so much detail. When I was researching the big book about personal responses to Lincoln's assassination, I just drunk up those details. But, and I knew that I knew that people were omitting things from their letters. But now I wonder more than I did before. What will we never know? I only knew because I was the person who erased that from the record. Um, you anticipate the next audience question. What okay. was the most difficult thing to leave out of the book? Mm. 
Oh, what a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I, I think this comes very much from my experience, again, with my editor um, and with two friends who are here this evening who read a first draft of the book, um, you know who you are, and of course, Bruce, my beloved husband, who's here, who also read early drafts of the book. And all of those people said to me, you're writing too much about other people and not enough about yourself. And one of my friends, who's here in the second row, he gave me this piece of advice. He said, you tell us the reactions of eight people before you come to yourself. <laughs> and then my other friend, who's in the audience tonight, said to me, I got worried when you disappeared from the manuscript. <laughs> And so I think I wanted to tell a multifaceted story with my experience and everybody else's experiences. And I realized over time and over many drafts that I needed to really center my own experience. And although that was the right thing to do, it was hard for me to say goodbye to all of those other voices. Um, someone else asks a very good question. What have you done with your diary and have you gone back to it subsequently? So I have that diary, and I have many, many other diaries. I kept, <laughs> I started, I guess, in 1968. Have you become a more reliable diarist? Well, you know, what's funny is that I kept a diary probably into my mid-30s, and then I stopped. And, you know, I think my life circumstances were different. I had my beloved husband who I could talk to every evening instead of writing in my diary. And I think that's part of, maybe that's why a lot of us, if, if we have sympathetic partners or friends, um, stop writing in diaries. So I have this long run of diaries. And you know I have spent some time reading through them, especially from my teen years and my college years, all kinds of interesting stuff in there. I'm saving them. They're in a box. You know, I talk to my other historian friends about this. Do we save our diaries and then when we're gone, somebody will do something with them or do we burn them and throw them all out before we go? Or do we, is it, I mean, once I'm gone, somebody else could throw them out, fine with me. Um, <laughs> My friends often joke about the Martha Hodes papers, which sends an utter shiver down my spine. Of course, when I'm gone, I won't care. So um, those diaries are important to me now, but I don't know what their fate will be. I heard the other night that George Kennan had kept a diary since the age of 11 until the age of 101. So wow. I think you have a way to go still. Um, for your vast research, how many languages did you have to know? And did you only use English language resource resources? Yeah, great question. So um, one of the places I went to research was the um, International Red Cross Archives in Geneva, Switzerland. And almost all of those archives were in French. I scanned them. Um, I do have a working knowledge of French. And so I was able to translate them myself and with the help of, you know, a translation program online, and for tricky passages with the help of, of scholars and, and fellow Coleman fellows, actually, who spoke French. Um, there were also documents in German, and I don't speak well enough German in any way or read it uh, well enough to know, but I also used translation programs and imposed upon friends of mine. Um, many of the tapes I listened to had Arabic speaking in them. And I don't speak Arabic, and I don't read it in any way. And so um, I was fortunate to be able to hire graduate students in the Middle East Studies Department at NYU. And what was so interesting is there are so many different dialects. And so I had to find a graduate student who was familiar with the Jordanian and Palestinian dialects of Arabic. And um, they came into my office with me, and I played the tapes. And they translated. It was quite a slow and rough process because there was so much noise on the tape. and. People were speaking over one another, but they were incredibly, incredibly helpful to me. Um, and I was very glad that I was able to do that. Um, but really, my only reading and working knowledge is my, my best is, is only with English. And so I had to use other resources otherwise. Um, one of the great questions that hangs over the reader's mind is what you did all day, right? Yes. I mean, this is six, this is your own yes. six day war. Um, and you really, you're very hazy about it. And then only at the end of the book, it's like page 280, you mentioned the tranquilizers. Yes. So yes. can you tell us about that? Yes. And do you have actually any physical memory of having taken them? So it's funny because I asked a lot of fellow hostages, what did we do all day? And the answer I got was nothing or I can't remember. And then the more and more I did research, and that was my memory too. I had no memory of what we did. I had some, but it was very hazy. Um, and that's in the opening pages of the book. But as I read more interviews with past hostages, I kind of put together a sense of what we did. We 
read whatever reading there was on the plane. We talked, we played cards, we played guessing games. Um, people's birthdays came around and we celebrated. People prayed. Um, we sang songs. Uh, one of the hit numbers that summer was Peter, Paul, and Mary leaving on a jet plane. <laughs> we sang living on a jet plane. Can you even and, listen uh, to that song today? It's, it's actually, it's funny. So uh, that's such a great question. We sang living on a jet plane. And one of the other lines is don't know when I'll be back again. And some people sound it, sang it as don't know if I'll be back again. We sang it sitting on the sand, the, the, the hostages laughing. We thought it was so funny. Now now when I hear the song, it makes me quite sad because I remember that that 12 year old girl trying to be happy and wanting, you know, wanting her parents not to worry about her. Um, so we did all of those things, um, but didn't have a lot of memory of it. I didn't have a lot of memory even of things like how hot it was during the day, how cold it was at night. Um, and don't forget, there were no cell phones, no internet, no cell phones. So we didn't know if the world even knew about us. And the press, you know, the press was holed up at the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman, which was in the middle of a war zone. And reporters would come out to the desert and talk to our captors and to us. And at one point, a reporter asked one of our crew members, or I should say, no, the crew member asked the reporter, we're on a news blackout. We don't know what's going on in the world. What's going on in the world? And the reporter said, you are the news. You are the only news. But there was no way to even know if our parents or anybody knew what was happening to us. So we were really in a, a kind of isolated situation that, that feels very unfamiliar in the present day. I mean, you were front page news for a week. As and I of that, discovered. You had no sense whatsoever. No sense at all. No um, sense at all. I, on right. a related note, I don't think I can let you off the stage without mentioning the Alice Kessler Harris coincidence, because oh, yes. it's just an insane coincidence. Yeah. So, um, have you thought about how she handled the aftermath and about how yeah. differently the. Yeah. So, the alternate scenario. Absolutely. Alice Kessler Harris is an eminent, distinguished historian at Columbia University. And Alice and I didn't know this about each other until. Um, I believe David Greenberg is in the audience this evening. And David knew both of us and is the one who informed us. Alice had been on one of the other hijacked planes. She had been on the El Al flight that was foiled in midair. And she had been traveling with her six-year-old daughter. They were coming back from, from spending time in Israel. And when Alice and I learned this about each other, we, we got together for coffee and told each other our different stories. And of course, she was aghast that I had been held hostage in the desert inside a plane for a week. I, in turn, was aghast at what she had gone through in the El Al plane, because what had happened in that plane was the hijacking was foiled because the captain had put the plane into a nosedive. Um, the passengers were seat belted because they had just made a stopover. And the hijacker stood up, and the captain knew that. And so he sent the plane into a nosedive to keep the hijackers off balance. And then they fell, and then people um, restrained them. But what happened was um, there was also an armed guard on the plane who shot one of the hijackers. That was the only death that hijacker died. And this was in the, the row ahead of Alice and her six-year-old daughter. So what they experienced was dishes crashing, luggage falling down, um, blood everywhere. And Alice's daughter, I write about this in the book, turned to her mother and said, you mean I'm never going to see my daddy again? So I was equally aghast, although Alice was home within 24 hours. Her experience was so, so horrific. One thing that Alice did that I'm very admiring of was she talked to her daughter about the hijacking when they got home. And that's not something my parents did. My parents felt it would be better not to bring it up. And I admired that very much about Alice, that she, that she made sure it wasn't something that was everything's OK now and was just forgotten. Thanks for that. One of, the, one of the things I think is most startling about the book, or the way you've written the book, is how little anger there is mm -hmm. on any level. And someone in the audience asks a sort of, I, I was going to ask you how that worked in your family, but one of the members of the audience asks a sort of similar question, which is, if it were in your power, would you grant the hijackers amnesty? Mm -hmm. And if not, um, what would you consider to be a fitting punishment for them? Such a hard question. I should also say that our hijackers were never apprehended. Um, I, we're getting a signal that we will we need to wrap up. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so we don't know who they were. It's, it's not within my power. Um, I'll repeat again that the strategy of hijacking was not favored by members of the PLO, so they were a minority. 
you know, we something called Stockholm Syndrome, which is never a medically recognized condition, would not apply to any of our hostages. Um, that was named after hostages who were um, connected to their captors and didn't want to be released. Not true about anybody out in the desert. So we did, we did want to go home. But we, we also empathized with them. And when my sister got home, she said in this taped interview, um, she said the words, no resentment. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, and my father said um, that he felt sorry for and empathized with them, but not their strategy and their tactics. So do with that as you wish. Um, why don't we end here? Um, Drew Faust, when she's talking about her memoir, which is out right now, has said she hoped the book would qualify as a history memoir. Mm, um, yes. So she grounds her experiences in the sweep of a larger set of events. So. And, and means to com combine the kind of personal awakening with the march of social progress. So did you have any similar ambition here? And what, do you, what did you want the reader to take away from the book? Yeah, I think those, those words from Drew Faust are wonderful. And in many ways, my models were other historians or other writers or scholars who've written about their own lives. They were, they were the people I emulated. Um, some came after me, some came before, but many of them were, were Coleman Center fellows, I have to say. Um, Annette Gordon-Reed, her wonderful book on Juneteenth. Um, Ava Chin, her wonderful book called Mott Street that's just out. Burkhard Bilger, um, his wonderful book called Fatherland about um, the Nazi party and his family. Um, Edward Ball, writing about his ancestors called Life of a Klansman. And this of is course, your fall reading list. It is. And of course, there's a poster there, Hua Xu's incredible book, Stay True, his memoir. So all of these were people who were either writing at the same time I was or before, where you want to research your own life as a historian, as a scholar, in order to understand more than just your memories and just the context. And one of the things that my editor said to me was, you know, a memoir is just, here's what I remember. But he said, you know, you want to do something different. Here's what I remember. Here's how, here's how it fits in with all of this deep research, other people's memories, other people's experiences, captives, captors, um, all of the resources that I drew upon in order to tell still only my story, but to tell it in the truest possible way. I don't think we can do better than that. Um, the you. book is sensational. It will be for sale outside the doors. The holidays are coming. Martha is here to sign for you. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, and thank you for doing it.